On the 1st of May, 1857, a special train carrying a hogshead of water from Charleston Harbor arrived in Memphis, Tennessee to celebrate the official opening of the first railroad to span the country from the Mississippi River to the Atlantic coast. 25,000 people watched as the water was pumped into the river in a ceremony dubbed the Marriage of the Waters. Few developments before or since have affected the course of events in the states through which it runs more decidedly than the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Nearly three decades before the marriage of the waters, on Christmas morning, 1830, a strange-looking machine pulled away from a freight house in Charleston, South Carolina, for a six-mile demonstration run. Hissing clouds of steam and belching hot ash from the smokestack, few had seen anything like it. But before long, the unfamiliar sights and sounds would become routine. It was called the best friend of Charleston, and it was the first train in America pulled by a locomotive to provide regular passenger service. The 141 persons flew on the wings of wind at the speed of 15 to 25 miles per hour, annihilating time and space, leaving all the world behind. On the return, the fantastic machine darted forth like a live rocket, scattering sparks and flames on either side and landed us all safe at the lines before any of us had time to determine whether or not it was prudent to be scared. From the Charleston Courier. When the best friend of Charleston made its debut, few railroads of any kind existed on the American continent. None went more than a few miles, and so the best friend's run of six miles was fairly typical. In less than three years, however, it had increased its route more than 20-fold making it, for a period, the longest railroad in the world. Its success fostered a surge of railroad construction, as the potential for steam power on rails was now apparent. The first development toward uh, rail travel was, of course, horse-drawn wagons operating on a rail of some sort. There was no steam engines available at that time, so animal power was the only means of providing uh, movement. Prior to this time, everything was horse-drawn. Horses were the way people measured life. They measured the tempo of life, the degree of speed, and the degree of distance by the beats of the hoofs of a horse. Horse-drawn trains bore little resemblance to their iron cousins of later years, but it was enough for a group of forward-thinking businessmen in Charleston to see the potential. And in December 1827, the South Carolina Canal and Railroad Company was established. This was in large part a response to another change that had been taking place. After the invention of Eli Whitney's ginning machine made the bulk manufacture of cotton cloth affordable, textile centers in the Northeast and in England could not get enough of the raw fibers. Within a few years, seas of the white plant covered the southern landscape. The invention of the cotton gin exponentially increased the uh, production of cotton, and when that happened, that led, of course, to the necessity of having more land for the growing of cotton that caused the tide of population to move westward, cut down forests, build plantations all the way to the Mississippi River. And when that happened, it created an immense demand for transportation. Delivering the harvest to the mills was difficult at best for most growers. Even where roads existed, hauling cargo overland by wagon was slow and expensive. This was especially true for heavy and cumbersome products like cotton and tobacco. At first, where possible, they tried to uh, do the cotton production near navigable streams, rivers that were large enough to uh, float cotton by flatboats and um, as they appeared by steamboats. 
But that uh, affected only the lines on the map where the rivers ran. With 16,000 miles of navigable water in the Mississippi River and its tributaries, most plantations in the West were not far from a usable port. Still, for many, the journey from gin to market could be especially slow and roundabout. Our cotton from the 1820s was shipped from over here by the Indian Creek Canal, 325 miles north by keelboat to Paducah, then west down the Ohio, then 1,000 miles past Memphis and New Orleans into the Gulf, and largely to England and France. The small railroads beginning to cross the landscape may have had limited usefulness, but for Charleston businessmen, even rough wooden tracks and mule power could be the answer to a serious problem. With its relative isolation from the rest of the mainland, Charleston was accessible to the agricultural areas of the state only by way of often impassable dirt roads or by silt-choked rivers and canals. Sending their harvest downriver to Savannah, Georgia was the only viable option for most South Carolina growers to get their cotton to market. And for several years, Charleston's businessmen could only look on as the competitor to the South siphoned off the lucrative trade. The South Carolina Canal and Railroad Company was chartered to divert that trade back to Charleston. In 1829, Horatio Allen came on board. One of the most experienced railroad men in the country, Allen had the distinction a year earlier of having assembled and tested the Sturbridge Lion, which was the first locomotive ever to be operated in the United States. Now, as chief engineer for the South Carolina Canal and Railroad Company, Allen did not hesitate recommending steam power for the new railroad. The power of horses is known, will never increase, but the future power of locomotives is beyond imagination. Horatio Allen. Track construction began in 1830. When complete, the railroad would stretch all the way across the state to Hamburg, a small community on the Savannah River that until then was the primary port for shipping cotton harvest downriver and away from Charleston. Persuaded by Allen's arguments, the South Carolina Canal and Railroad Company received its first locomotive in October of the same year. The fantastic machine was given the name Best Friend of Charleston. Test runs commencing in early November went well, and with six miles of track completed, the owners felt the time was right to begin regular service. In a twist of fate, the best friend would not be part of the future promised by its bold adventure, as just six months later, it achieved the dubious honor of having another first for railroad history. One of the workers that was assigned the duty of keeping it, the fire stoked on it uh, in between runs got tired of hearing the uh, escape of steam from the safety valve and uh, not knowing the consequences tied down the safety valve to stop the noise, which uh, led to an explosion uh, shortly thereafter, killing the, the person that had tied it down and several others in the area. In October 1833, the full length of the track from Charleston to Hamburg was complete. With a distance of 136 miles, it was the longest railway in the world at the time. Within a year, the South Carolina Canal and Railroad had 15 locomotives in operation. With a scheduled daily run in each direction, the company was a commercial success. If my grandfather had been told that his great-grandson, at this day, would dine at one in the evening and go to bed the same evening, 120 miles distant, he would have called the prophet a fool. Virginia lawyer James Davidson. Railways changed the way people did business. They changed the way that business was conducted in America. By the mid-1830s, it was clear to most that railroads were here to stay.
While the first tracks were being laid for the Charleston to Hamburg line, two states away in northern Alabama, the Tuscumbia Railway Company was building its own two-mile line to move cotton bales from town to the Tennessee River. Opened in 1830, the simple wooden rails and horse-drawn train of the Tuscumbia Railroad became the first railroad west of the Appalachians. From Chattanooga to Decatur, riverboats had little difficulty operating on the Tennessee. Past Tuscumbia, the river is a broad, easily navigated highway that stretches to the Ohio and Mississippi channels. Between the two cities, however, a rocky stretch known as Muscle Shoals was impassable to anything but shallow draft keelboats of limited capacity. Not long after the Tuscumbia Railroad opened for business, local plantation owners began planning the development of what they called an iron river to bypass the shoals. Named for the towns it would connect in January 1832, the Tuscumbia, Cortland, and Decatur Railroad was incorporated. A year and a half later, cheering crowds greeted the company's first steam locomotive, the Fulton, as it puffed triumphantly into Decatur to celebrate the finish of construction. In 1826, Georgia Public Works official Wilson Lumpkin left Savannah on horseback as part of a team to find the best routes for a series of canals that were to be a part of a proposed systematic plan of internal improvements. Results of the survey were disappointing for the planners, however. Concluding that canals would be too expensive to build, the study recommended that other alternatives should be sought. Watching as other states opened their iron rivers to commerce, it was not long before the Georgians realized their future also would ride on a set of rails. Although but a few miles of railroad were then known to the world, and those constructed of wood, destitute of iron and propelled by animal force, after full investigation of the subject, I became fully satisfied that even wooden railroads with mule and horsepower should be preferred to any canal which could be constructed in Middle and Upper Georgia. Wilson Lumpkin. For years, United States expansion throughout the Lower South had pushed native tribes of the region into ever smaller enclaves. Treaties guaranteeing the Indian sovereignty over their remaining lands helped maintain a peaceful coexistence with their white neighbors for a few years, but many Americans still believe the natives' presence was a detriment to progress. One of those sharing that view was Wilson Lumpkin. He knew from the survey that the best route for much of the proposed railroad would be across land occupied by the state's Cherokee population. Upon Lumpkin's election to the U.S. Senate in 1828 and subsequent appointment to the Committee on Indian Affairs, he was in a position to push for legislation that would give Georgia a legal basis for removing the tribes still remaining in his state. I was rather impressed with the belief that it was my particular mission to do something to relieve Georgia from the encumbrance of her Indian population. The impetus for relieving his state of that encumbrance came that same year, when gold was discovered on Cherokee land near present-day Dahlonega. Soon an influx of fortune seekers turned into America's first gold rush, and encroachment became crisis. President Andrew Jackson used the occasion to help gain support for passage of Indian relocation laws. Opening the whole territory to the settlement of whites will enable those states to advance rapidly in population, wealth, and power. The waves of population and civilization are rolling to the westward, and we now propose to acquire the countries occupied by the red men of the south and west. Andrew Jackson. The removal of the Indian tribes opened great quantities of land that was available for people who were trying to find a place to move west. So that led to the development of land, clearing the forest, building plantations, growing crops. Construction of the Western and Atlantic Railroad of Georgia began in the former Cherokee village of Standing Peachtree. Renamed Terminus because of its position as the line's anchor point, 
the town that evolved would go through other name changes before finally settling on the more familiar Atlanta. Work progressed slowly at first, but with the completion of a tunnel through Chattoogata Mountain in May 1850, the line finally opened for traffic all the way from Atlanta to Chattanooga. While the western and Atlantic carved its way slowly north, another line was extending west from the Savannah River. The Georgia Railroad first opened in 1841 as a 39-mile track from Augusta to Athens. By 1845, the line had reached Terminus, renamed Marthasville in 1842, to join the southern end of the western and Atlantic. With the latter's completion, Georgia had continuous rail from Chattanooga to Augusta. Seven hundred miles from Charleston, a small town perched on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River did not look like much in 1830. Memphis, Tennessee had been incorporated exactly four years when the best friend of Charleston made its public debut. Just two years earlier, the first of several yellow fever outbreaks had claimed 150 lives so that in 1830, fewer than 700 people remained. Stagecoach service to the town was less than a year old and regular steamboat service would not begin until 1834. But anticipation was high for what the future of Memphis might look like, and no one was busier promoting that future than John C. McLemore. Credit for Memphis becoming a railroad center, probably more than anyone else, it goes to the pioneer, John Christmas McLemore. He had a vision as a developer of what this city might be. He was the one who bought land south of what is now Union Avenue and began to develop the bluff area there. Born in Orange County, North Carolina in 1790, at 16, McLemore moved to Nashville to train as a surveyor. There he met and married Elizabeth Donaldson, Andrew Jackson's niece by marriage. In 1828, McLemore traded a tract of land he owned in Madison County for Jackson's 600-acre portion of Memphis. Through the years, McLemore bought additional property there, eventually acquiring over 900 acres on the lower bluff. Although McLemore would one day move to Memphis, for the first few years he rarely visited. But that did not keep him from becoming one of the town's most active promoters, and he induced many settlers to move to the river town. Particularly enticing was the availability of millions of acres of fertile land perfect for growing cotton that had been ceded to the United States government by the 1818 Chickasaw Treaty and which now attracted development by wealthy plantation owners. Memphis was established far in the wilderness, of course accessible by the Mississippi River, but for getting to it overland the problem was just never really solved until uh, the building of railroads beginning in the 1840s with John C. McLemore's uh, LaGrange in Memphis. A former Chickasaw Indian village, LaGrange, Tennessee, in the early 1830s was still an active trading post. In December 1835, the LaGrange and Memphis Railroad was incorporated by the Tennessee legislature. Construction began from Memphis, but after three years, never made it past White Station, six miles from town. Rising labor costs and loss of income due to the Panic of 1837 forced work to stop, sending many of its shareholders, including John McLemore, toward bankruptcy. By 1844, its time was up, and the company's assets were sold at auction two years later. In late October 1846, the Honorable John C. Calhoun, former Vice President and Secretary of State of the United States, left his home in South Carolina for the first of several great commercial conventions to be held in Memphis. To get there, he first had to travel by ship down the Atlantic coast, then into the Gulf of Mexico to New Orleans. There, he transferred to a steamboat for the final 72-hour leg up the Mississippi to Memphis. The entire trip took over two weeks, average for the time. John C. Calhoun was a 
major advocate of developing one of our great resources in Mississippi River. It was the great inland sea, as he referred to it. He came here to promote that development. He believed strongly in actually using federal money to develop our infrastructure and our uh, internal improvements, as it was called. The convention over which Calhoun presided brought together 600 delegates from around the country, with railroads at the top of the agenda. In his opening remarks, Calhoun predicted what would be the most significant legacy to come from the convention. The scheme that seeks to connect the Mississippi with the Atlantic is to be the most important topic discussed during the convention. In less than one generation, the Mississippi Valley will become the center of commerce for the world. John C. Calhoun. The idea to link the Mississippi River to the Atlantic Ocean with steel was not new. As early as 1835, Calhoun, as Senator for South Carolina, had advised his state as well as neighboring Georgia to use their share of surplus federal revenue to fund a route then being proposed from Charleston to the Mississippi River. In 1846, the Memphis and Charleston Railroad Corporation was established to build the railroad encouraged by Calhoun more than 10 years earlier. One condition of its charter stipulated that the new company had to purchase the state's interest in the defunct LaGrange and Memphis. In addition to creating the longest railroad network in existence to that time, the Memphis and Charleston would also be a bellwether for future railroads. By knitting together existing track wherever possible and laying new track only where necessary, the company would save millions of dollars and months of work. Picking up where the failed LaGrange and Memphis left off, the new railroad would ultimately extend through northern Mississippi and Alabama to connect to the Tuscumbia, Cortland, and Decatur. New track would connect Decatur to Stevenson, Alabama. From there, existing track could be used as it connected to the southern end of the Nashville and Chattanooga, then to the western and Atlantic, the Georgia Railroad, and finally, the one that started it all, the South Carolina Railroad for the final 136 miles into Charleston. We learned that two sets of hands are now actively engaged day and night in putting down at both ends of this road, and the whole work will probably be completed about the 1st of April. That is cheering news indeed. The completion of this great enterprise will send a thrill of delight from the Atlantic seaboard to the Mississippi River, and pour in upon our already steadily prospering city a flood of commercial wealth. Let us prepare to realize our brilliant destiny. From the Memphis Appeal, 1857. The last spike was driven on March 27, 1857, making it possible to board in Memphis and travel all the way to Charleston without having to change trains or tracks. Track connecting Charleston to Washington, D.C. had also been finished, reducing travel time from Memphis to the nation's capital to a record-setting 79 hours. We rejoice at the annihilation of distance and the approximation of neighboring districts which hitherto Mountain River and Slow Locomotive have kept apart and sundered. From the Memphis Appeal, 1857. Even before the marriage of the waters marked its official opening, the Memphis and Charleston Railroad was a commercial success as service was extended to each section as soon as it became available. Between 1854 and 1856, cotton carried by the line jumped from 57,000 bales to nearly 100,000. No city felt the changes bestowed by the Memphis and Charleston Railroad more keenly or more quickly than the city where it started. Memphis' location on the river had already established it as an important trade center for river commerce. Now, overnight it seemed, Memphis was an important transportation hub for the entire country, rising to prominence as the world's leading spot cotton market 
and one of the nation's largest wholesale grocery distribution centers. Memphis was a transportation center. It was a center for land development. And for a while, when, when uh, indigenous crops produced so much money, first mainly cotton, not so much corn or soybeans or wheat, those things came later. But first, uh, cotton was the cash crop. And then there was timber to be harvested. Of course, that led to more land available for agricultural use too. But all of that produced crops that weighed something and uh, took up uh, volume. Even with the compression and baling of cotton, cotton crops still required an immense amount of transportation. It would fill train cars or fill steamboats. And in the case of lumber, and Memphis was the hardwood lumber capital of the world for a while, that uh, required a great deal of weight and volume. Transportation was necessary for it. So Memphis just naturally became a transportation center. As the Memphis and Charleston progressed eastward, railroads were already changing the face of America. With dependency on river transportation reduced and the disadvantages of inland isolation offset, a number of new urban trade centers began to emerge. Nowhere was this truer than in the South, as one by one railroads brought places closer together. Railroads opened the whole inland area to commerce. People could actually make money. They could easily get their crops to market, as well as travel from one place to another. Their standard of living improved greatly. With the soaring cotton production and profits made possible by railroads, also came the need to employ thousands of workers to weigh, mark, receive, and ship the cotton. Stores opened to sell goods from distant markets, and warehouses were built to supply the stores. Industry also flourished in other ways as factories, textile mills, and brickyards were built. It seemed by the mid-1850s that all of the South's dreams were being fulfilled. Not only was cotton the foundation of the southern economy, it was the foundation of the American economy. Well over 50% of all American exports in 1860 uh, was from cotton. And uh, so it was the foundation for the wealth in the north and the foundations for the industrial revolution that came afterwards. In time, cultivated land would increase by millions of acres as plantations on each side of the route were worked to their fullest. The railroad also prompted the development of several new communities along its corridor. When the two railroad lines were laid out, the Memphis and Charleston, which was the east-west line, Mobile and Ohio, which started at the Gulf and went to the Ohio River, they, the engineers had them crossing here. As a result of the crossing of the railroad, a city grew up. Originally, it was called Cross City. The name was soon changed to Corinth, and like its Greek namesake 2,000 years earlier, this city would, before long, find itself under siege by invading legions. From 1861 to 1865, the country did its best to tear itself apart. The contest has been called by several names, the War Between the States, the War of Secession, and the War for Southern Independence are among the most common. It has also been called the First Railroad War. While the first shots fired were against a small fort in the middle of Charleston Harbor, the real fighting began and ended with railroads at center stage. What the Union Army called the Battle of Bull Run, the Confederates dubbed the Battle of Manassas for the nearby railroad junction located there. From Manassas, tracks led directly to Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia. And it was the promise of a supply train waiting with provisions that brought Robert E. Lee's army to Appomattox Courthouse in the spring of 1865. 
In between the two events would be thousands of battles, large and small, with some of the worst being fought over pieces of iron rail. For the first time in history, railroads transported whole armies and mountains of supplies between fronts. A few hitherto unfamiliar places also earned their pages in history books. Two such places, one a nondescript river landing in Tennessee, and the other a small town in Mississippi, would be among the many to see armies clash for control of the Memphis and Charleston. Together, they would set the stage for defeat of the Southern cause. As 1862 opened, the capture of forts protecting Nashville, followed by occupation of the city, bolstered Union confidence as the Confederates were pushed from the area. With unfettered navigation of the Tennessee River all the way into Alabama, the Union Army had access to several points within striking distance of the Memphis and Charleston. As the only trans-Confederate railroad in existence, military planners on both sides were aware of its importance. Dubbed the Vertebra of the Confederacy by Jefferson Davis' first Secretary of War, Leroy Walker, tactical planning now centered on protecting that vertebra. Toward that end, southern armies began converging on the rail junction at Corinth, Mississippi. At the end of March, Union boats carrying forces led by Ulysses S. Grant began pulling in at Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee. Before long, nearly 49,000 blue uniforms blanketed the landing area and more were on the way. The Army of the Tennessee, the Union Army, of course, was um, striking for its primary objective and that was the railroad crossing at Corinth, Mississippi. Uh, they had just uh, captured Nashville. They thought that the um, South, at least in the Western Theater, was on the run, maybe one battle, capture of Corinth and the war would collapse. So they came down from Nashville, uh, joining them, Don Carlos Buell's Army of the Ohio coming over from Columbia. We're of course going to meet at the Pittsburgh Landing. They could be resupplied by uh, transports coming up the Tennessee. Remember there, the uh, Tennessee River flows north. But um, they could be resupplied, reinforced, and that would support the march overland some 22 miles to Corinth. On the night of April 5, 1862, 45,000 combat troops of the newly designated Army of Mississippi tried to get what sleep they could, knowing they would face battle the next morning. Just two miles away, the men in the Union camps bivouacked near a small log church whose name in Hebrew means place of peace, but would ever after be associated with tremendous suffering and give the battle its name. On Sunday morning, April 6, the Battle of Shiloh began. Two of the bloodiest days in U.S. history followed, serving as a wake-up call for all of those, North and South, who thought the war would soon be over. The Sabbath closed upon a scene which had no parallel on the Western continent. The sun went down in a red halo, as if the very heavens blushed and prepared to weep at the enormity of man's violence. Night fell upon and spread its funeral pall over a field of blood, where death held unrestrained carnival. Soon after dark, the rain descended in torrents, and all through the dreary hours of that dismal night, it rained unceasingly. The groans of the dying, and the solemn thunder of the gunboats came swelling at intervals high above the pelting of the pitiless storm. Colonel Wills de Haas, Commander, 77th Ohio. Following a second day of horrendous suffering, the Confederate Army was forced back to Corinth. In all, the two sides had 23,000 casualties. It was the worst battle of the war to that point, but just a taste of what was to come. The Union Army arrived outside Corinth on May 25th. The Confederate Army inside the city, weakened by the staggering losses suffered at Shiloh, was ill-equipped to defend against the much larger Union force.
On May 30th, the Union Army took possession of Corinth and its railroad junction. The Confederates would return more than once to try to retake the city, but except for one day in October of that year, were never successful at dislodging the Yankees. Losing control of the Memphis and Charleston Railroad, it is now becoming not a Confederate asset, but an objective to destroy so the Union cannot use it. Fort Pillow north of Memphis was untenable and it had to be evacuated. Troops in Memphis were certainly subject to being surrounded and cut off and captured, so they were pulled out. So Memphis was just left here waiting to be uh, attacked by a Union naval force and perhaps one of the largest naval battles of the war. So the loss of Corinth certainly made Memphis um, an open target. Six days after the Federal Army marched into Corinth, the Union Navy clashed with Confederate gunboats in view of Memphis townspeople who watched, fascinated, from the bluff. The result was a crushing defeat for the rebels and the elimination of the Confederate naval threat on the river. Memphis remained in Union hands for the remainder of the war. Their big responsibility was to protect this. Once they lost that, then, of course, they had to uh, rely upon roads further south and rivers, which was far more circuitous. For the north, you could bring supplies and troops down the rivers to Memphis. And if you could get them to Memphis, you could transport them east if you kept the railroads working. So, of course, after that, it was the south that tried to break up the railroads and the north that fought to keep them open. In late September 1863, things had gone badly for Union General William Rosencrantz's army. After a stunning defeat near a small stream in northern Georgia called Chickamauga Creek, his soldiers were back in Chattanooga and under siege. At the time, William Tecumseh Sherman was in charge of the occupation forces in Memphis. Ordered by Ulysses Grant to join him and 20,000 reinforcements in Chattanooga, at 10 o'clock on the morning of October 11th, Sherman, with about 250 officers and men, boarded a train and headed out of town on the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Thirty miles to the east, Confederate General James Chalmers was leading a cavalry division of 3,100 men and artillery from Mississippi toward the small Union fort at Collierville. Fire! Arriving in Collierville just as Chalmers started his attack, Sherman ordered his men to join those inside the fort and call for reinforcements from Germantown, five miles to the west. A short time into the battle, Chalmers sent a demand for the unconditional surrender of Sherman, his troops, and his supplies. Sherman replied that he was not paid to surrender, and the battle continued. For a time, the rebels seemed close to success and even had possession of the rear of the train, taking five horses in the process. Among them was Sherman's favorite mayor, Dolly. But upon the arrival of reinforcements from Germantown about 4 p.m., Chalmers was forced to call off the offensive. The main importance of that battle is that it served as a reminder just how vulnerable and how important the railroads were to the war effort. By that time, they knew technology was being used as it had never been used before, was changing the, the art of war, and keeping that railroad open was vital. Sherman made it to Chattanooga and the Union Army regained the city. Within a year, he would capture Atlanta, sealing Lincoln's re-election, and begin his March to the Sea. Wherever possible, civilian rail travel continued throughout the war. Even in the South, with destruction of rail and stock a constant threat, Service was usually restored in those areas separated from the fighting and could seem little different than it had been during peacetime. Still, as one of the Confederacy's favorite diarists observed, Southern Bells often found they had to share their journeys with reminders of the war. The cars were jammed with soldiers to the muzzle. They were very polite and considerate and we had an agreeable journey in spite of heat, dust and crowd. There was not an inch of standing room even, but everybody in tip-top spirits. At the station, I saw men sitting on a row of coffins, smoking, talking, and laughing. Thus does war harden people's hearts. Mary Chestnut
By the summer of 1865, everything had changed. Where two countries had existed at war with each other, there was again just one, though it would take a few years before everyone accepted the idea. The plantation system that had built and sustained the Old South was gone, never to return. And the South was broke, structurally and financially. In time, the region would be rebuilt and its fortunes restored, though it would not look much like it had before. The instrument of the resurrection would be a new transportation system built upon the demolished rails of the old. The entire infrastructure literally had to be rebuilt. And at that time, infrastructure requires the rebuilding of the railroads. The rebuilding of the Southern Railroads was essential for restoring the economy of the South. Prosperity for the South returned in fits and starts, and survival was not easy for the remaining railroads. To rebuild, as Memphis and Charleston President Sam Tate observed, required money no one in the South had. What little machinery we had was scattered all over the South and cut off from us, and had been run for four years with little or no repairs. We had over 100 miles of road to rebuild, all of the buildings to renew, and hundreds of miles of road to equip and run with but little cash means and no credit. But as great as the embarrassments were, we were determined to overcome them if possible and restore the property to active use. Sam Tate. By 1875, the Memphis in Charleston was on the verge of failure and looking for miracles. Desperate financial arrangements with its creditors kept the railroad open for several years, and, at times, it seemed the company might pull through. Eventually, even the Memphis and Charleston had to face facts, and in 1892, its trains were parked for the last time. John Pierpont Morgan, having successfully reorganized other railroads in the North and in Europe, began doing the same in the South, starting with the bankrupt Richmond and Danville. In 1897, his budding railroad empire, now called the Southern Railway Company, absorbed the remains of the Memphis and Charleston into its system. In less than 10 years, mileage of the system would double as the company's earnings went from $17 million to $54 million annually. More important for the South, the presence of a large, well-financed, and successful railroad eliminated the final hurdles against returning prosperity to the region. The South could industrialize. Elysian Fields could become Birmingham, Alabama, and the Pittsburgh of the South. It meant now that cotton markets in West Tennessee uh, could load their cotton at Brownsville and Henderson and Jackson and have it uh, transported to the textile mills. It meant that textile mills in East Tennessee and uh, factories in North Carolina could now get cotton and of course a resupply of that cotton to the northeastern mills in, in Massachusetts. It, it began to bring, tie the South together with the North and, and was the foundation for uh, a redevelopment of, and of course then the wealth that came with that and the rebuilding of the rest of the infrastructure or banking system. The period would be remembered as Railroad's golden age. Between 1896 and 1916, passenger sales tripled as trains carried 95% of all intercity traffic. By 1920, over a billion passengers rode trains annually. Ultimately, all golden ages come to an end, and the one enjoyed by the railroads was no exception. 
one by one, the steam locomotives which had captured the imagination of everyone who found romance in seeing the landscape slip beneath iron wheels began to be replaced. On June 17, 1953, Southern Railway's last giant steam locomotive, number 6330, pulled its string of freight cars into the company's Chattanooga yard. To symbolize the passing of the fire to the next generation of iron horses, it stopped next to one of Southern's newest four-unit diesel electrics. On the other side of 6330, a full-size replica of the best friend of Charleston sat, as if waiting for another load of passengers. The whine of the headlight generator faded to a whimper. The feather of steam faded her pops. The sobbing choke of her cylinder cocks stopped. There was nothing more the 6330 could do. Walter Gay, Ash Pittman, Southern Railway. In the end, nothing the railroads could do would be enough to keep Americans riding. And the once familiar sights and sounds of trains like the Southern Crescent and the Royal Palm speeding past on their journeys to far-flung destinations ceased to be heard. The interstate highways, which had hastened the end of passenger service for most railroads, affected even the rail cargo business. When intermodal shipping and containerized freight began to revolutionize all aspects of the shipping industry, Southern Railways was among the first to transform their operations to accommodate the new system. In 1982, the Norfolk and Western merged with Southern to form the Norfolk Southern Corporation, and in 1991, the combined railroad changed its name to Norfolk Southern Railway. With 3,900 locomotives, 98,000 freight cars, and 22,000 miles of primary track, Norfolk Southern has more rolling stock and nearly as many route miles as existed in the entire country at the end of the Civil War. Norfolk Southern's Crescent Corridor, a 2,500-mile network of tracks stretching from Louisiana to New Jersey, will expand existing rail lines to accommodate more and faster trains new locomotives and rail cars, and 70 new terminals to handle the increased volume. A new intermodal yard in Rossville, Tennessee will serve the Memphis leg of the project, which will run to Chattanooga following the tracks first laid for the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Its impact upon the lives of those of us who live along that railroad may not seem as apparent today as before, except, of course, if we sit cursing our luck waiting for a long freight train to pass. But it would be difficult to find a single development that from its inception had such a crucial part in the events of the region. Its glory days are behind, our love affair with it long gone, but it plays as vital a role today as it did a hundred years ago, and as part of today's complex transportation system it could still be called the vertebrae of the South.